Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Noreen Lacey, and on behalf of Bike Back, I'd like to welcome you all to our succession webinar here tonight. It's at this time of the year that people start thinking about, you know, the year ahead and maybe even the years further down the line. Family are home or coming home, and it's usually a good time to get the conversation started. So we know that succession planning isn't always easy, but it is essential. And it's important that you get the right advice to help you make the right decisions for your farm and everyone's circumstances are different. Without further ado, I suppose I'd like to hand you over to Alan Jago, who will chair our webinar tonight. And uh, Alan will introduce you to our panel of experts and we hope that you find the webinar useful. Thank you. Alan, over to you. Thanks very much, Noreen. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're all very welcome here tonight uh, to this and very important topic around succession. And I suppose the whole conversation around succession can be a sensitive topic and not easily broached um, around the kitchen table at times. And I suppose succession, if it's done right, can be um, if it's done right, can be you know a very very much a success for the farm. But if it's done wrong, it can be a costly mistake for for many farmers. And I suppose to try and address some of these challenges here tonight, we have three panelists. We have Declan McAvoy, who's head of tax in IFAC, Karen Walsh from Walsh and Partner Solicitors, and Philip O'Connor, who's head of farm support in IFAC. But maybe before we go to panellists, we'll go straight to a little video that we've done with Donald and Thomas Shinnick, where Stuart Crowley from the Mallow office caught up with them recently. Donald, listen, thanks very much for having us out here today. Um, and you might maybe just start by giving us a small bit of the history of the, of the farm here in Butterwind. Yes, I suppose. Thank you, Sean. I suppose, look, I suppose um, my parents would have been customers of IFAC historically before. And when I started our family, maybe in myself in my own right, maybe in the mid-90s around that, I stayed with IFAC as well, with the IFAC in Mallow, it was convenient, and with the recorder system, we stayed with that system. And um, I suppose the farming, we were farming at that stage, maybe when I took over, maybe around, it was in the quarter times, and maybe we'd have maybe around 100 cows, maybe in around that, would have been around uh, the scale of the operation at that stage. And... Um, um, which, um, uh, as we moved into the later 90s and there was maybe quarters was being leased and that was kind of the, at the, the opportunity at the time you had to lease on bits of quarter if you wanted to expand, right. expect on mm -hmm. and um, I suppose we progressed on and we done development and I suppose maybe through the, um, the early noughties we'll say the years there was kind of a, um, there was quite a bit of development done in the yard and I suppose there was um, to, to the, um, capital, there was quite a good bit of stuff being written off for capital, so it was, um, my, my tax situation wasn't as, as big an issue. As well and then was, as we yeah. came towards the end of the noughties, we'll say, and uh, the, the business became, got a bit larger, mm -hmm. and, and we, we, moved, we, we moved into the company then in I think about 2009, 2010, okay. uh, after consulting with Dick and McAvoy at the time, you know, advisors mm -hmm. on that, yeah. and, uh, and how to structure ourselves in, in that. And, and tell me, Donald, did you find the company was of a benefit to you in terms of growing the business? Yeah, I suppose the, um, one of the bigger benefits of the company, and I suppose at that time there was a bit of uncertainty about single payments, where would they stand? Because like the, the company was kind of a new enough concept at the time, and um, but it, 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 it all, everything, everything, there, there was, um, we, it was tied onto the farm, we'll say, transferred onto the company. But um, I suppose from the, the cash flow point of view, the, the 12 and a half percent tax like it, it, it was a big a benefit in retaining um, maybe cash within the business that, yeah. to grow on the business yeah. because um, at, if, if when we were paying at a higher rate um, of taxation it was draining us of cash flow like to for to, um, to pay to pay to pay for any expansion not to pay your bills at, at, at towards coming towards the year end yeah but, it was, uh, it was the ideal vehicle really wasn't it to to, to help to grow the business um, um, and and to improve cash flow and the difficulty for people might have been to try and grow a business and to pay the tax bills at the same time. Correct, yeah. There, 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 was, there, there was a kind of a bit of a conflict for the... Uh, or even, like, people were kind of working as a kind of an individual year, trying to kind of trying to manage your year end. But as a company, we'll say at the 12.5%, it, it, it doesn't make that much of an impact. Yeah. And like we said, 10 years on, plus now, we were very satisfied. And look, I suppose the trends has been in the last maybe five years, a lot of farms are gone that route now. That route, they've they've yeah, gone that yeah. corporate route, incorporated. Yeah. And so we come along, so we're 10 years further down the road from the limited company. And I suppose, you know, um, in terms of succession and succession planning, um, 
you guys have had to, as a family, you've had to look at that. And, you know, when did that conversation start? A number of years ago, we'll say, so th Thomas, um, when he was uh, finishing his, we'll say, his uh, education in Bodavent, he signalled in he wanted to do the agricultural course in, in Palace Kinray. And um, that, that, we said, was over two years when that was done. I suppose when he had that done, he, he was, we'll say, from, from the age of maybe 16, he was registered as an employee. But at, at that stage, and we were looking, looking to, um, I suppose, to maybe to, if he had committed, to the family to bring him in then and uh, I suppose we looked maybe at our what current wheels we had as well mm -hmm. and we uh, we took some advice on that we said because our, our situation was changing at that stage yeah because like yeah. He, he was giving commitment to go working on the farm we have three more daughters younger than Thomas and they had to be cared for as well or you have to kind of put a plan in place for that and um, I suppose that maybe led us on to maybe look at the partnership and look um, it was, it was um, this year, we formed a partnership now with the company, we say, with, or, or the, the company and Thomas is in a partnership uh, yeah. at the moment going forward. So, we, yeah, we formed a registered farm partnership um, with, with the company that we set up in 2010 as a partner with Thomas. Um, and, you know, what was it you were hoping to achieve uh, with that, Doral? What was the... The, 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 the plan with that, I, I suppose, was, I suppose one of the, the important things was, was to get the younger person involved in the business and involved in the, the day to day running and the planning what you want to do going forward. Um, now, we, we, we have um, increased the cow numbers quite a lot over the last few years. We, we got some additional land near us there in about 2015. And look, we're, uh, we're milking just almost 400 cows at the moment. But um, we, we need to do a job in a milking parlour. Now, we, um, we're, we're, we're awaiting planning approval at the moment because there's, there's road, road um, scheduled quite near us at the moment and that is, that's holding up the planning at the moment. But other than that, we, we, we had planned to be working this year on the parlour. But like, hopefully next year now that we will get going on that. And look, there is some TAMS um, uh, grants available on that. And look, by trading with the partnership and with, the, with Thomas as the, the, a member, it, it would help to maybe have some of those grants on that as well. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's probably the ideal um, starting point, Donald, to succession, isn't it? To bring the younger guy in and get him involved both, um, you know, not just as an employee, but also involved in the, 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 the decision-making process that goes on around the farm. Like, is Thomas enjoying that? Is he taking... Oh, he does. He like, he, yeah. And I'd say... He, I, 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 I could see he's, he's much more, we'll say, um, more enthusiastic about some, we say, even the, the work on the building now and that, that we were placed out in the parlour. He, he had a lot to do with what he, what he wanted to put into that parlour, no more so than myself, because obviously he'll be, he'll obviously be getting more value out of it, or maybe spending more time at yeah. it than me. Yeah. But um, he was very interested, we went looking at other milking parlours now and stuff, uh, viewing other things. But um, oh, definitely so much more, like, I suppose if you're, it, it brings you more involvement in, in, in it, like, and I suppose it would be, a gradual change, at, and, and you'll review your situation again um, in, in maybe four or five years' time, when the rest of the family will be a bit more mature, and that you can be reviewing your um, the, the, the shareholdings on, on, the, on the partnerships. And I think, in, in fairness, the, the thing about the plan or the succession plan, Donald, is that it, it's probably something that's going to evolve over time anyway something that people should review maybe every five years or so because the family are getting that bit older maybe more family members might want to become involved um and it's it's just you know it's a stepping stone towards the transfer of the assets to the family down the line i've seen a lot of places where there was good developed um farms and where some of the younger generation didn't get a their chance or their time in time we'll say it was too late when they got their involvement on it like fellas maybe well into their tortures and they got an involvement and nearly the best of their their years are nearly the more enthusiastic when you're younger we tell you yeah. the better years are when you are kind of nearly i'm nearly gone by that stage and look there isn't a huge amount of people involved in the farming scene at the moment so when a younger person gives the commitment as well you, you have to give a bit of recognition for that as well to get them involved in that in, in get, get them involved uh, in the business in that way and tell me, will you stay involved yourself? Are you you're a relatively young man? I hope for another bit, and uh, uh, I'm, I, I'm in the mid-50 bracket now, but uh, hopefully I, 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 what I, I'd be hoping to, if we get uh, the parlour into the Saturday out, I'd be, I still do a lot, a lot of the milking myself. We have a relief milker, comes in, does a fair lot of milking, and we'd have another person as well, and my daughter helps, helps out as well at all times. But uh, we'd want, in the springtime, we'd want four to five 
in, for weekends and cover when the pressure was on uh, in the month of February. We carved 250,000 in the month of February, so you would need a lot of, a lot of hands on deck <laughs> and a lot of long days. So I won't be retiring for a you few more years. <laughs> <Yeah. right. Okay. laughs> but uh, if you're um, planned out, I think it's a bit like the, the accounts and the succession, a small bit of planning and a small bit of um, uh, organisation, you get through the you get through the structure. And like you have to be structured in 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 in, in anything you go about. If, if you're structured, you can get through the the, the day or the, or the month or the year, or whatever it is. But if you're structured, if you're, if you haven't got a structure, like it's you 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 somebody will be under pressure. You 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 want to achieve what you want to do, like. Yeah. Listen, Donald. Thanks very much for your time. It's very informative. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're very welcome. So thanks very much to the Shinnick family for sharing their succession story with us there. And I think a lot of what they went through tonight, or what they went through in the process will be dealt with here tonight. And just before we go any further, if anyone has any questions or comments or queries, you can pop them into the chat box below and the panel will do their very best to try and answer them a bit later on. So we're hoping to finish up here at nine o'clock, so we will get straight to the panel. So Declan, I might come to you first there, and I think, look, the Shinnick family story is, you know, a very good model of, of farm succession. But I suppose from, from your side, where, where does this conversation begin? How does the succession story start? Well, the one thing that came out there from Donal was how important communication is. And it can't be overstated, the importance of it. You know, there's good communication, there's good lines of communication there within it. And as Donald was saying, they've moved from employee to partnership on the road to succession. And as I always say, you know, on seminars I give and I speak at, a plan in the head is not a plan. You need to talk about it within the family. And it's not just the person who's taken over the farm has to be involved in it. It's the whole family. Because, you know, Alan, you know, farms are looked at as, as the family farm mm -hmm. and that type of thing. You know, and it's not possible to be equal with everyone, you know, but you need to be fair, you know, with it. So if you have 150 acres and you have four children, it doesn't make sense to divide that up into 37 and a half acres apiece, you know, so you look yeah. at it. So number one is communication. That's where you start at. And by putting communication, you start talking to the successor. You know, and you, you you bring them in early, like Donald did. You bring them in early into it, work through it, look at the goals for the business, look at the goals for the outgoing generation and for the incoming generation. And that can lead to conflict because there can often be the incoming generation might have a different view of the farm and different goals. But again, by communicating, it's going to help develop the overall family plan. And, you know, at that stage, then develop the family plan, start talking to all the professionals. And it's not just talking to your accountant. It's talk to your solicitor, your ag advisor, your bank. It's all the professionals need to be brought in, you know, because it's hugely important that everyone's on the one page to have a successful business going. I, I suppose... Declan, there's two words probably come up with a lot of people in terms of succession, fear and worry, and a lot of it around money and taxation. Maybe can you just maybe go through briefly some of those things that you need to, families need to be concerned about or need to look at or need to address before they go on, on this journey? We're probably lucky with the suite of reliefs we have in taxation in farming, you know, because with proper planning and with proper conversation and early conversation around it, the vast majority of farms will be able to be got over to the next generation with little or no tax. You will come up with little quirks in the tax that's unique to each farm, but that's something, you know, that you can work through by planning and again, talking it and taking proper advice. So tax is something that can be got around. The other thing is money, and that can be the biggest single area, and Philip will talk about it earlier or later on. Viability, you know, comes into it. Is the farm viable? So it may be viable for one family to live out of. It mightn't be viable for two families to live out of. So is that going to impact on the transfer to the next generation? Is it going to delay it? Is there any changes can be made to the farm to look at it, to see can it be made more viable? But I would say, you know, and the way farms are and the way farm incomes are going, you know, they're getting tighter every year. So viability is 
probably more important than tax. Okay. And, and maybe at this stage, I'll bring in Karen here just a small bit on the legal side. And it's something that uh, I suppose we, we're all afraid of accountants, but we're even more afraid of solicitors, Karen. Um, look, maybe from, from the legal side, Karen, what, what's the first steps that you think or that, we, that you see that people should be following when they come to you um, looking for advice or help along the journey? So the first thing I think with succession is, is to put a will in place because there's a lot of people who would feel like I, I'm going to transfer the farm to my son in five years' time, but then there's no will in place. And, and what you need a document that's going to bridge the gap between now and five years' time. Because, and I've seen situations where there's been an untimely date. And for example, a typical situation would be there is a husband and wife, farm is in husband's um, sole name, and let's say there's three children. So if there's no will in place, then the two, two thirds goes if the part if, if the let's say the landowner passes away two thirds passes to the wife and the remaining one third passes to the children in equal shares so it gets very messy and it also means that let's say the child who's at home farming who who who, uh, who who's committed to it is left in a really vulnerable situation then because he or she hasn't been given the farm and it it, it can lead to litigation and it can lead to Family, family members falling out because not everyone will have an interest in farming, not everyone will have an interest in the farm, but most people will have an interest in the value of their share in their inheritance. And that need, that can all be avoided by putting a will in place. So, so that's the first thing. It also gives an opportunity to look at the inheritance and draft a will from an, um, in, a, in a kind of a tax efficient way. And, and the other thing I suppose is um, you know, a lot of people now aren't getting married till later on in life or they're not getting married or they're choosing to have children before they get married. And that there is no automatic right for a partner um, in, in, in an estate unless specific provision has been made for that partner. So it's very important from that point of view as well. So the first thing is you need to get your will in place and you just... You know, it, it mightn't be something. It mightn't be something that you're hundred percent happy with at that time. But the best will that reflects your wishes right now, and you can always update it over time. And then, as regards the farm transfer, there's lots of questions to ask. For example, are you going to leave everything pass in a will, or are you going to transfer in your lifetime? That's the first. That's the next decision to make. Then, are you going to transfer all of your lands now, and and or, or maybe hold some lands back, maybe some sites back for siblings? Are you going to transfer the family home now, or and keep a rental residence in, um, for yourself and your spouse, your partner for the rest of your life, or maybe you're going to leave that pass in your will? And who's to get the family home? You know, it's it's not all about legal decisions and tax as well. It's actually practical. Where is the where is the farmhouse? Where is the family home? Is it on the farm? Is it a few miles down the road? Should it be going to that person who's farming? Can it go to someone else? And 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 looking at the siblings and how they're going to be looked after for because as Declan said, it's very difficult to be to, to treat all children the exact same and to give them the exact same in monetary terms. And um, you have to find other ways of maybe looking after other children. Um, and it's very difficult to give to, to divide a farm between three or four children because number one, it might be viable. And I suppose the other thing then is, you know, it, it, the more people who own land, the more room there is for disagreement and for the farm maybe being put up for sale. So there are other things to consider. Um, um, it, there, there are things to look at when you're deciding how to do how to structure it. And again, the tax advice is important. Um, and I mean, there's other things as well about how you want to look after, let's say, the, the landowner. How do they look after themselves financially, even from an emotional point of view? For example, maybe putting a right of maintenance support on the deed, even though they may never ask the successor for any money, it can give a bit of comfort that if they ever needed something in time, that the successor would look after them financially. Um, and, and that can be tweaked or worded. And, and maybe on that, Karen, there, look, the, the Fair Deal Scheme has come into operation now since, you know, October. Maybe can you give us some bit of detail on that, maybe, and, and just some of the background to it, maybe, and, and what people should expect? So there was a new change in October. So you, now the farm, the, before the farm wasn't capped, so it, it ran forever, the value of the farm. 
Um, and but now with this new change, the farm can be capped, so you can contribute seven point five percent of the value of the farm towards the cost of your care for a maximum of three years. But there's there's specific conditions on it, and it's very much geared to the farm being actively farmed. So it it doesn't apply to giving the farm to a child, let's say, and they're just going to lease it to a neighbour. So so the, the the main conditions are is that it must have been farmed for actively farmed for three out of the previous five years before care by the farmer, by his partner or her partner, or by the successor. And then the successor must commit to farming it for six years after the application also. So it's 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 detailed, but it, it's straightforward at the same time. Well, it's certainly an improvement from what the way it was. Yes, it's detailed and there's strict criteria and declarations have to be signed and it can be reviewed. They can check it during the period as well. Very good, very good. Okay, so we move on to Philip, Philip O'Connor uh, from uh, IFAC in terms of farm support. Philip, you might just maybe go through you know, some of the farm structures that you know the young farmer can enter into with, with, with the parents um, and how they develop that into you know, ultimately taking over um, you know, to, to complete the full succession cycle. So maybe, Philip, your own thoughts on that, please. Um, thanks very much, Alan. Well, <clears throat> the video is actually very informative and, and Don covered it quite nicely himself and how he did how he did it himself with his son, Thomas, as in the, the, the succession was a stepping stone. It was a plan that was going to take over a period of time. So in that case, and what I do like to see, and I see quite a lot in farms, is like the son or daughter, they come home, they're working on the farm as a wage. They might have gone to the eye college, they might do the green cert, they might have done a different type of education, and they come home. And they're, they're a wage in the farm, so therefore they're, they're a labour unit, for want of a better word. And then I suppose the next stage you see that they often come into then is bringing them in as a, into the partnership as a profit share. And the registered farm partnership has been there now. It's been there since 2015 by the department, and it's it works really well. And it's it works from across a number of bit of benefits. It works from the succession point of view, as Deccan touched on the stepping stone. It's bringing the son, their son or daughter, into the farm, getting them involved. They're no longer getting a wage. They're now getting a profit share. Um, you haven't handed any over assets over to them yet, but you've started this road to succession. Everywhere. They've they've expressed a serious interest in working with you and working on the farm. Um, and the department have helped with that. Like so the schemes that they've brought around that, like so firstly, like to go into an RFP, a registered farm partnership, like they actually cover a portion of the fees because it is a legal structure. You're doing the accounts, you're doing the solicitors, they cover a portion of those fees up to five thousand euros. Um it allows the young farmer, assuming they have the green start or necessary agriculture qualifications to get maybe access to the National Reserve. The um young farmer's top up grant. Um, you get access into the TAMs. So in other words, the young farmer, is, is, is while he's he's coming into the partnership with himself and his own enthusiasm what they want to do with the farm, he's also able to bring a, 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 some, a level of financial muscle with them as well to help the farm to grow, whether that be true, helping it with extra capital grants. Like, I mean, the TAMs grant, um, which has been going now for, what, five years, up to 60% spend and a spend of 80,000. If, um, if you're in the RFP, you get to double that. So it is very nice, like, if you know what I mean. So it does help. And what it does mean is, and you, you haven't handed over, and Declan might touch on this when he comes back on in a few minutes, you haven't handed any over any assets yet in the RFP. So you're, you're farming the business together, but the, the, the core assets of the land and so forth are still retained ownership by, the, by, the, by their parents, if you know what I mean. And it's, it's, you, can, you can plan that phase out then. So it does work very well from that regard. It's, it's a very good transition method of, I suppose, you know, the younger farmer coming on board with the parents, the, the responsibility gradually transferring to the younger farmer. And I suppose it gives confidence to the parents when they eventually hand over that farm to the younger farmer. It does, and I'll be honest, we're we're in the same we're in the, that, that's the exact structure we are ourselves at home in our own farm. Um, that's how my own parents have done it myself. That's how Don Shinnick is doing it with his son, um, and it works like. And I mean, like there is like we didn't do it in our own particular farm. Like we didn't step in. There's a there's an add on to that succession partnership that people can like. So you're in a registered farm partnership. You can add on what's called a succession partnership, and there's some added tax benefits. And I said, Jack, and we'll cover that in a bit as well. Like, but. There is, it is a nice segue into it, like, and I mean, it's 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 setting up that part of the farm. Now, there's other assets, like, I know different any of our families, I've other siblings and so forth, like, but, um, so, but there, we're looking at that particular aspect of the farm, like, so it's a bit like Declan was saying earlier on about, about, you have to be fair as well, like, so, but you can't divide it up necessarily equally. 
Um, so look, it, it, I do like that structure. It is very popular for that reason. There is a reason why there's a lot of farmers going down the RFP route because it does allow that, that bringing in of the younger farmer while not handing over assets, seeing how the farm runs, getting them involved in decisions. Donald touched on it there nicely in his little video as well where he mentioned about um, people coming in their late 30s, whatever, not having any decision making in the process. Like when you bring your a son or daughter into the RFP, they're actively involved in the business. They have core decision makes to make. They are part, they're going off to meet the accountant. They're going to meet the solicitor. They're going to the bank. They're signing checks, if you know what I mean. So they're, they really are actively involved in the farm. Okay, you, you mentioned something there about succession partnerships, I think is what you said. I did, yeah. Declan, do you want to maybe elaborate a small bit on that? Yeah, well, succession partnerships, succession partnerships were brought in from 2017 to help facilitate succession. You know, and what they are, they're aimed at people under 40 years of age at the time of transfer. And there's a couple of main conditions around it. Number one is that 80% of the farm must be transferred. And number two is the successor must be under 40 years of age at the time of the transfer. Couple of other tight conditions. You can only enter into a registered succession partnership after you have been in a registered partnership. And the earliest you can transfer is three years from the day you enter into the succession partnership. So there's a lot of restrictions around it, but the benefit of it is there is 5,000 per year for every year to be divided in the profit sharing ratio between the two partners up to the time the successor reaches 40. So there's limited applicability for them, but they do work. Very good. We've, we have a lot of questions coming, but I want to go back to Karen here quite briefly. Karen, you, you mentioned the whole area of wills, and I, I suppose you know, that that's one of the, the key areas that, you know, from your side, that people need to focus on. Um, I suppose we mentioned the fair deal, but I suppose the whole, the whole process around the succession from, from your side, you know, when, when a parent um, or a young farmer comes to you, what do they need to do? So the, the first thing is there's two solicitors now in every transaction and before it was the one solicitor was involved with the farm. The farm transfers and the succession process now has just become much more complex. There's banks involved, tax consultants involved, solicitors, um, agricultural advisors and, and there's um, it's it's just it, it's a bigger transaction than what it was before. So so for both people really both people need to be independently advised so they understand exactly what's happening, what their obligations are. For example, the successor under the deed of transfer, um, and what's and and so the, there's everyone understands. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, so so valuations will be required. Maps may need be required if parts are being marked out or if their sites being retained. All of that's very practical work, which the solicitor will guide through. The valuations would have been obtained anyway because the, the tax advisor would have needed the evaluations to give the tax advice. Um, so if there's a bank involved, let's say there's a charge on the land, um, so the bank would need to consent to it. And then um, the successor, it, it, it would have to be agreed that the, is, is the successor taking over the bank loan and the bank... The, the bank, it, it can take some time for the bank to consent, you need to apply for it and it can take, sometimes it can take a few months, so that's, it's just be mindful of that. Um, and then, then what's very important as well is when the successor obtains the farm and, and the day the deed is signed is the day they own it. Registration on the land registry, it could take a year, it'd take a year and a half if there's mapping involved. I, I often hear, oh, I'll do my will when I'm the registered owner but they're the owner on the date of the deed, so they should create their will, update their will, especially, you know, most of them will have young children. Um, appoint, it's very important to appoint guardians, a trust for young children, um, because, uh, because they're the owner of valuable land. Now, it's also very important for the landowner to maybe update their will, even though they've transferred this valuable asset, they may still have other assets and maybe need to look after other children then. Um, another document which is very important and um, it actually ties into the whole fair deal application too. If someone in care is not of sound mind and a fair deal application, for example, needs to be made, um, that person obviously can't make that application. And one way it can be made is by putting it, 
if there's an enduring power of attorney in place, then that, that attorney can make that application. Okay. And so that's a very important document to put in place. And just briefly, it's it's a document you create when you're of sound mind, whereby you appoint someone, usually a spouse or a family member, to make decisions, financial decisions on your behalf in the event that you ever do become of unsound mind. Okay, thanks, Karen. And Philip, maybe going back to yourself there, um, Declan mentioned at the beginning regarding farm viability and look from your own side there, where you're engaging with farmers very much on a daily basis, I suppose the viability of farms, farm incomes, farm viability, um, income over expenditure. <laughs> we, we've gone through a lot of these debates ourselves, you know. Um, I suppose from your side, what needs to happen? Oh, that's an easy question, Alan. God, solve the farm viability problems of Ireland. Um, look, I suppose in one way, right, so the, sometimes you nearly say that the the larger, more, I suppose, full-time farms are sometimes nearly easy succession plans to solve, if you know what I mean, as in there's enough income being generated in the farm or the farm has got the ability to expand. And we, we saw that over the last number of years, particularly in the dairy industry, where farmers were able to expand post-quota bring sons and daughters home and generate enough income on the farm to bring them home. And that, that that's an ideal scenario. And look, in fairness, again, I not to touch on it, but that was the scenario Donald was in, if you know what I mean. He was able to, to expand his farm. Uh, it's, it's profitable and his son Thomas came home. It does get a bit more harder um, when you do have a farm that maybe not necessarily can generate, not alone, one full-time income, but to bring a son or daughter home to try and generate two. And sometimes look that it is about maybe the person who is home and they're there and they can work off farm. Like So, I mean, again, I'll go back to the partnership. They're not restricted to full-time farmers. Like, I mean, you can be, you can rerun the farm, you can have off farm income, you can work part-time in the farm. Um, I would nearly say then as well, that I like to even go back even another step. I mean, I talk to farmers at the moment and they have, no kids are very small children and we are we're we we have conversation about maybe look that you may be starting to planning for your succession on the road that maybe that when you do get when you eventually I'm talking about ourselves here, me and you, for example, that when we get to our ages, that we have a pension plan maybe in place, that we have other sources of income. So that we're not all reliant on the farm to provide income for everyone literally to the age of death, if you know what I mean, that there's other sources of income that is there like that. Because let's be brutally honest, like the the, the statutory pension is small. Um, and like, it is good to be able to have another source of income. So we need to put a, put aside some money now that when people do get to that age, and it does make succession easier when you have a farm and a, a parent is able to say, God, yeah, I have a pension, whether that's they put aside themselves or maybe they're not farm income and they put a pension aside. And it just leaves, there's more, there's more flexibility within the farm for somebody to come in then and maybe earn a few euros themselves and, and start building on the farm themselves as well. Like, so it does, but... Yeah, it, it can be it can be hard with the smaller farms if you know what I mean. Where it's like King Solomon, you can't absolutely yeah. you can't just cut it all up if you know what I mean. Yeah. yeah. But my final point on it, like, and we've often the seven decking off and talk about this. Whether the farm is viable or not, it is an asset. It is there if you know what I mean. So even though people might have a, a perception of God, it's a small enough farm. It's only fifty acres. It's only sixty acres. Land is a valuable, valuable asset, and. I think the worst plan is no plan at all. You do need to decide something. So even if you're not sure where you're going to give it or who you're going to give it to or is somebody going to come home, you do need to still sit down and think what it will happen this asset and what will I do it because they are valuable. Like, I mean, we all know what they, like, I mean, what do we say? I did a report there recently or last year that the average farmer is 33 hectares, which is what, about 70 odd acres. And the Farmers Journal did their article there. There's a last year, the average value of land is about 11,000 euros. So, Average farm in this country is worth north of five, six hundred thousand euros. So while there might be a whole lot of cash in the system, it is a valuable, valuable asset and it does need to be planned. Okay, I think guys, we'll move straight into the questions because there's a lot of them coming in here. Um, so I go to the first one here. My husband inherited the farm from his father in 1979 and registered it in his name. In 87, we got the farm into our joint names and now we want to transfer to one of our daughters. I was at home minding your kids and helping on farm. But started working in 1999, but my husband has been farming it, and we both are now, as I retired in 17. We are both over 69. Can he, we, qualify retirement relief, the relief on CGT? Our solicitor says that the farm may have to be first transferred back into my husband's name only for to qualify. So wondering if this is correct. Maybe Karen or Declan, do you want to come in on this one? I'll deal with the tax aspect of it. 
see, the tax aspect goes back to the facts of what happened on the ground. You know, um, was the bank account in joint names? Is there proof that the spouse entered into transactions on behalf of the farm? Was uh, were, you, were you able to prove that? If the bank account was in joint names, if loans were in joint names, if a lot of what was going on was in joint names at that stage, then it may not be necessary to transfer back. But it will depend on the facts of the case. If the bank account was in the sole name of the husband, everything went on in the home in the sole name of the husband, it might, it would probably be necessary from a tax point of view to transfer it back to the husband to avail of the relief. But um, there can be issues around transferring back depending on what has happened. It's a complex question um, tax-wise. And, and Karen, maybe from your side, from a legal point of view, we'd be led, you, us solicitors would be led by the tax advice. From a legal point of view, it's not a big transaction to transfer property between spouses or place property in joint names into a spouse's name, but into one spouse's name. But I suppose the only reason it would be done is because there's a tax, there's, there's a tax element triggering it. But if it makes sense from a tax point of view, it certainly can be done from a legal point of view. Okay, thank you. The next question here, is it more advisable from a financial point of view to hand over the farm early or leave it in your will? Maybe, Philip, do you want to maybe take some of this? Um, no, that's actually, a, a, like, I mean, from my point of view, yeah, you farm together or not, like, hence I spoke earlier about the partnerships, but really that's more of a tax question, whether it makes sense to hand it over now or you hold it on. So I'll, 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 I'll fire that back to you there, Declan. Well, I'm, I'm firmly in the camp of that a lifetime transfer is better because, for one thing, there's certainty around it. You know the tax law at the day you're transferring it and, you know, you can plan it out. But, um, you know, uh, that's that's it from a tax point of view. But I think there will be legal things in it as well. Karen, what would you think? Well, from what I see, most people transfer in their lifetime rather than a will. And um, if there's pros and cons to it, um, from I suppose from a financial point of view, um, certainly there's so the reasons maybe for holding on to the land is you you hold on to it for the rest of your life. You can change your will umpteen times before you pass away. Um, you know, as Declan says, that nobody knows what the tax will be on debt, whereas at least the devil you know is the devil you know right now. Um, um, but, um, and then, you know, valuations, the, you, you kind of know what the value of the land will be around now on debt. That's, you, nobody knows then. Um, certainly, I suppose, in a will, you don't have to think about stamp duty, young trained farmer relief, consanguinity relief, all of that. But that, that wouldn't be a reason not to transfer in a lifetime. Um, the fair deals, I suppose, was always a big thing, was probably the big financial um, incentive to transferring in a lifetime because people were afraid of, of the farm being taken into account in, in the calculation of the fair deals thing, but that has improved now. And, and maybe, Karen, just on that, you would say in a lifetime, what you're meaning here is transferring it when, when the parents are hale and hearty. Um, rather than on debt, when you, when you say in a lifetime, just to... Yeah, yeah, a lifetime transfer, yes. Yeah, perfect, perfect, perfect. Uh, another question here, if you have a small farm and maybe in your retirement age and your children are not really interested in farming, what advice is there about dealing with succession? And look, this is probably something that is affecting many farmers out there that, you know, kids might be after, you know, flying the nest and moving to the big smoke. Um, you know, what, what's the best way to, 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 to pursue this? I leave it um, open to the panel. <laughs> yeah, I, I think from a tax point of view, you should look at it and look at what's the best thing you can do not to damage tax reliefs. So don't rule out tax reliefs. You know, like a, the first option may be that the person is thinking of, I'll get to an age and I want to lease out the farm. Yeah, leasing may be great from an income tax point of view and it solves an income tax point of view. But by leasing out the farm, it boxes in a successor to get agricultural relief only. You know, where if a successor, a child, a child is taking over at some stage in the future, you know, that um, agricultural relief may be out because their assets may be too high in the future. So it's something to consider. 
just look at it, look at look at the options. I always say that there's four options. You continue farming, you go into partnership or something with someone else, you share farm with someone else. So partnership and share farming is, you know, similar on the ground from a running the farm point of view. You keep the farm active, you lease out the farm or else you come along and you look at maybe selling the farm if you don't have any successor coming in. So I would say from a tax point of view, is look at all the options, see which is the best and which keeps everything open for you until you see what's going to happen. A question here, Declan, maybe back to you again um, regarding companies. If the business is incorporated, is it necessary to transfer any land over to the company where new farm buildings are to be built by the company? The company is farming, so the company is entitled to the tax allowances on those buildings because it's farming. It then comes down to the legal point of view, and I'll just answer it and hand over to Karen. At that, at the stage, if they're looking for grants, they must have a right to the land, which is a minimum of a five-year lease for the department. You can lease the ground into the company, you know, and have some clause in the lease that if the farm, if the company stops farming, that the farmer that buys it back at a, say, an agreed depreciation figure per year after a number of years. But I would say that you don't have to transfer in the land into the company to build it, but it's about getting a proper legal structure on protecting the land. Yeah. Any views? So, well, just actually, generally we wouldn't transfer land into the into the company name that would be least done. Um, we, um, we wouldn't do that. But just going back to what Declan said, actually, which is interesting, it, and, and what was said in the video, that sometimes when you're, sometimes it's not, it's good, like what you'll see a lot of people will get the, the advice just before they think about starting the succession plan. But at that point, maybe there's a problem with qualifying for retirement relief or this child qualifying for agriculture relief because there's, there's too many, they've leased the land for too long. So it's actually very important to get some succession advice, maybe, you know, years ahead, just even to have the consultation and um, just so you know um, that you're not doing anything that cause, could cause problems maybe 10 years down the road. Absolutely. A question here. I will be the successor of my uncle's farm. So towards, so towards that, should he sign over the farm now or wait until the will comes? Also, I am working a full-time job and there will be salary on my behalf. So would that affect the partnership for tax purposes? Declan? Um, no, salary, the off-farm income, because what it, the way he'll be taxed is, um, you know, a person will be taxed on their share of the partnership profits. So if they have a salary out of an off-farm job or that, that will be added to their share of the partnership. So it's a matter then of structuring the partnership, structuring uh, how they're involved in it, structuring what income they get out of it. But no, it won't affect it again if it's structured properly. So to take proper legal and financial advice on it. So there's another question here, and Karen, you have addressed it here will it go regarding land into the company. Is it advisable to put all the land into the company? And just to contradict the question, sites for children, I assume, should not be transferred to the company. Also, getting out funds out of the farm company for siblings of the successor is it subject to normal income tax rates in the hands of the father? I can answer the question on income tax, but generally, we the land would never be transferred into the company. It would be leased, and um, so the land would always remain in in, in the personal name. Um, and as regards sites, um, it it depends on what the landowner wants to do. The, are the sites being retained, let's say, for other? The, the, generally, it would be kept in the personal name and, and always and just be leased. But and if, it, it depends on if the sites are. Are the sites being held back for other siblings um, and are they going to be kept out of a lease? Um, I, yeah, I would assume that is by the question here, I would assume, yeah, yeah. And, and Declan from the tax side? Um, yeah, you know, just the tax, the tax question there is getting the funds out of the farm company for siblings. Is it subject to normal income tax in the hands of the father? Well, it is, if you just dip your uh, hand into the pot and take the money out, it's subject to income tax. But with proper planning, you know, there could be an unused part of a director's loan that you're able to get cash out of. 
there could be, if you're exiting the company, there's favourable treatments on share buybacks on retirement relief available on getting out, provided you've met the terms of it. So you can avoid income tax by planning, and you could even avoid all taxes on getting cash out if you plan it. Okay, Karen, a question to you here on fair deal. Would a revised fair deal scheme apply to a situation where Nevu has been farming his uncle's land for the past 10 years and the nephew will inherit the land? So nephew qualifies as a successor. Um, um, so yes, there's, there's certain criteria and certain relatives will qualify and the nephew is one of them. Perfect. The next question here, how do you manage entering a son into a partnership when he is working out of farm and not taking a wage on farm, but is involved in running in both labour and management, bearing in mind there is a second son in the picture? Maybe i come to you here on this one, Philip. Yeah, well, look, the, the, the partnership is a, is, is a living document. It's not set in stone. So you can bring your son in. Um, in that case, um, as Declan says, like he can work off farm. So it's part of it. Like there is ways of, of shifting profits and so forth. And it kind of, you can still tax plan within the, within the partnership structure. The partnership can evolve. You can, you can bring in people. So like, so in that particular farm, so we say son A, so parents and son A formed a partnership today. Three years down the line, Son B decides to get involved. We bring Son B into the partnership, and we we evolve it. So it's it's not it's not a set stone. And to be honest, the best partnerships are ones that evolve and work and change. So, and you shift your profit shares. And as Declan Karen would talk about, um, land can be transferred in the background if you know what I mean. So the partnership's a living document, and it can change. So it can adjust to the circumstances of the family or if other successors wish to get involved in the farm, and therefore you're farming with more than one person in the partnership. You could have two siblings farming together in the partnership, no problem at all. Very good. Uh, a similar question was asked here a ago. What advice would you give to a farmer who doesn't know who would be the successor to the farm? Maybe Declan, you had the four options there, hadn't you, a ago? Yeah, it, it's back. Don't rule out anything, you know, because you can continue farming yourself. You can be in partnership or enter into a share farming arrangement. You can lease out the farm. And, you know, as I said, you know, the option is if nothing is available, you know, and there's no one interested, it could get to the stage that you eventually sell it. Or you could leave it in your will, you know, that if it gets to that stage in your life, that you could leave instructions for the children to sell it afterwards. So it's every option that's there. But don't don't close the gate on any one item. Just keep everything going. And as you're still on the line there, Declan, Registered Farm Partnership for Succession, is it only 80% only for the farm that has transferred before the successor reaches 40? And if land transferred between the ages of 36 and 40, does stamp duty have to be paid? The second part, first of all, yes, stamp duty has to be paid the minute you're over 36, over 35, sorry, but it's at 1% at the moment, you know, to a blood relative, so if it's to a son or a daughter, and the second and the first part of it is, yeah, the full farm doesn't have to be transferred. It's 80 percent has to be transferred. Perfect. Can you claim ag relief if you inherit the shares in the limited company on the debt of a parent? Do the shares have agricultural value for the relief? There's no agricultural relief on the shares in a company, even if it's a farming company. But there is business relief on it. And business relief is available is can actually be um, less onerous on one side because the assets of the individual getting the business uh, are not taken into account, but it must be a business that's carried on. Very good. Karen, a question for you. What criteria do solicitors follow when determining if a medical fitness report is required for a farmer transferring the farm? Um, well, it, it, I suppose it, it's it's up to the solicitor to to ensure, and they have a duty to ensure that the person transferring the farm, you know, uh, it, it understands what they're doing, is capable of giving instructions, and if there's any doubt, um, maybe if, if you had a very elderly client, or if the solicitor had a doubt, um, they could obtain a doctor's medical certificate, but that that's not. Med, 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 medical capacity and legal capacity are actually two different things, but um, it, it, it's for the solicitor to to be satisfied for themselves and for their own file that that person was was that they were capable of giving instructions that they weren't being put under pressure to hand over the farm. This this shows again the importance of independent advice 
and um, meeting the client, meeting the landowner on on their own, and um, with, without the, um, the the child or the nephew or the niece in the meeting. Um, so it's it's not it's not a it's not an essential requirement. It's 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 the solicitor will make a call as to whether it would be needed. And if there was any doubt, um, if there was any doubt about that, that that solicitor just wouldn't act. Okay. Uh, a question here from a small suckler farmer in the west of Ireland regarding a fair deal scheme and its implications. Is there a mechanism for a 70 year old farmer to transfer the land to a venture successor, but for them to maintain their farm payments, etc., and farm into the future until they're ready to stop farming themselves? The farm in this case is small and the farmer is not really suited to a partnership. Declan or Karen again? I'd say it's Philip. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I thought Derek was going to answer this. So, yeah, is a mechanism for to transfer the land to eventual successor? Well, there is mechanisms, and as a fairness, Declan and Karen have covered that in in uh, in covered as what they've spoke about. But look, um, well, can, you can, 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 can he maintain his payment? His BPS payment? Yes, I would be. He assuming. can. He can if he is farming. So in other words, you have to be actively farming. A lot of talk going on about that at the moment. So like, in, yeah, there is no upper age limit to claiming BPS. So if you are the farmer, you can claim the BPS. Um, if you enter into a quasi-share farming arrangement or a partnership with someone, you're you're still farming, so you can still pay it. Like, so yes, he can he can claim down the payments, but like, you can't be. I suppose in inverted commas, renting the farm to somebody else, and they're doing the farming, and you're, but it's still going through your name. No, you're either farming it or you're not. If you're farming it, you're perfectly entitled to claim the entitlements. Okay, perfect. I'm just very conscious of the time here, so we'll rattle through a few more. I own a small second farm, and I work full time off farm. My husband's farm, my husband farms this land on a second farm. Is it advisable to put into joint names if we want to transfer it in time to our second daughter? Um, for, from a legal point of view, there's no difficulty transferring the joint names. Sometimes it causes problems because if they're, if, if let's say a typical scenario would be the wife isn't farming and, and then they want to transfer to a child in time and it may cause problems. Just, what we said, just, just like the first question there where um, it might be causing problems for retirement relief. Um, Declan? Yeah, yeah. Um... You see, it's a very hard question to answer without the full facts of the case, because you, you could have two similar cases and one it makes sense to put it into joint names and the other one it doesn't, because you have to look at the long term, you have to look at the farm, you have to look at all farm income, you have to look at everything. So you need the full facts of the case to be able to determine whether it makes sense or not, because it could rule out a spouse out of retirement relief if that spouse wasn't going to be working on the farm and you might have to transfer it back into a sole name at some stage in the future. Okay, we'll take one last question here, and, and it's a bit of a, a complicated question, but it's maybe something that is maybe common throughout Ireland. Uh, we have a small farm at home, 60 acres roughly. My father is not a retirement age, and we both work off farm, but he is not putting in the work on the farm itself, and I know if a partnership was in place, the workload won't be shared. I have been doing 90% of the work for the past few years, is partnership really ideal for a situation like that? Maybe I'll go to you, Philip, on this. Um, well, look, the, he, his parents do own the land, like so unfortunately it is up to their decision when they want to transfer to him, yes or no. Like, But I mean, you would hope that, that's where Declan said, the very first word Declan said, were actually in his opening comments, was communication. So I would be saying to sit down like, and talk to them. like, And as regards sharing the profit shares, like, if you know what I mean, again, that's a conversation that has to be done in communications. And sometimes, look, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But I do think what I would be strongly saying is that maybe you need to sit down and decide why. But maybe the son is not unaware. Maybe their parents do need all that 90% of the income. Maybe they're unaware. Like So, yeah, to me in that situation, I think it is probably sitting down and having an honest conversation on the kitchen table as regards where the both come from. Because sometimes you can find out that the parent is thinking one thing and their son or daughter is thinking another. And they don't realize what each other is looking at or how they're viewing it. So, I mean, as say, say Decker said, very first thing he said, communication, and I think they do need to sit down. The partnerships can work and evolve. So, like, that partnership share can change. It could be 90-10 now, it could be 80-20 next year, it could go to 50-50 in five years' time, so that can shift all right. 
Okay, I think we might leave the questions there, ladies and gentlemen. And look, before we just go back to the panellists for a, a quick sum up here, uh, I think IFAC have committed to try to come back to as many of the questions that haven't been got to tonight. If the names were, were, were given um, on the questions, or indeed they might try and put something together on social media and answer some of those questions together. So maybe Declan, I might come back to you there just to sum up from you from your own side here. Well, you know, and I emphasise again, communication is hugely important. Plan, get the family involved, look at all the tax reliefs, get all the professionals involved, and by proper planning, you will help the whole business and the viability of it as well. And I just sum up, a plan in the head is not a plan. You know, you need to get it down in paper, you need to talk about it, and from a farming point of view and from any point of view, Karen, the one the big things, whether you go ahead or implement a plan or not, you need a will. So I would leave it on the importance of a will cannot be overstated and should never be overlooked. And maybe, Karen, that ties nicely into yourself. Um, I suppose the first thing would be not to, not to leave it to the last minute. Don't leave it to a few weeks before the sun is about to turn 35 and everything has to, everything needs to be done in a massive rush um, or, or making a will in, from your hospital bed. Um, put a will in place. It's a great habit to get into. It's not as bad as what people think. I know people have a natural reluctance to contemplate their own debt and, and it, 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 it actually, it's not an expensive document to put in place. So it's really worth, it, it provides great peace of mind later on for your, for your next of kin. And, and just get, it's a collaborative effort, get professional advice early on, get, get your team appointed and, 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 and get good advice. Perfect. And maybe that leads back into Philip in terms of advice and, and getting good advice, Philip, maybe from the IFAC side, maybe. Yeah, well, look, I, I think, look, I, I've, I've touched on like getting the creating the right business structure to allow the succession plan work like um, as regards whether that be a partnership, um, looking at a company, um, and brilliant and, and they can work all together. So like I mean it's a stepping stone, it all works together like and getting all that professional advice together um is really important because there's so many moving there's so many moving parts in it. Like there's tax, there's legal, there's the Department of Agri, there's actually day to day running the business. Um like you're talking about succession planning, we we mentioned it earlier, and you talk about succession planning from taking it from your own parents, but there's also succession planning to your own family. Like there's a lot of farms have three generations, if you know what I mean, if you think about it. So it's thinking about, well, how do I provide for my family for the next time around, if you know what I mean? So it is about getting all that and tying all those moving parts together. And Declan said it like getting it down on paper, reviewing it, looking at it. So it's not a case of sitting down, oh, I think I'm going to look at succession. And then putting it in a drawer. It's like that once a year that you sit down, you review it, you look, you talk with your accountant, you talk about your solicitor. Is the plan working? Does it need to evolve? Do we need to bring another sibling in? Um, that questionnaire on from that person about the, the profit share. Do we need to adjust the profit share? Somebody might have got married, somebody might have had children, somebody might have might be looking to go into a nursing home. So it's 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 about the evolving of the plan and adjusting the plan to work for the needs of everybody. So and as I said, that can often be three generations. You talk about grandparents, parents, and children. So it's 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 about it's about evolving that plan and making it work for both the business and for the people involved in the firm. I think a common team from from the three of you guys here tonight is you know having a conversation early, having it with the advisors, having it you know with, with IFAC, with, with the accountants, with the solicitors. You know, bring everyone involved on on that journey as as early and as soon as possible to, to, to drive this conversation around this whole area of succession. So look, at that, I'd just like to thank our three panellists here this evening. I'd like to thank Declan, I'd like to thank Karen, I'd like to thank Philip, I'd like to thank Noreen and all the rest of the team in IFAC and Traction Media also for hosting us here tonight on this webinar. And look, thanks to all of you for tuning in tonight. As I said there, IFAC will do their very best to come back and answer so many of those questions. Uh, thanks to all for tuning in tonight. And as it's the 9th of December, I'm probably safe enough now in saying uh, happy Christmas to all and wish you all the best for 2022. So at that, we leave to tonight's webinar. So thanks very much to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.